And so I welcome again, Professor Ove Hergeborg. Can you please turn on your microphone and your video and share your screen, Ove? And we I, can- I can. Fantastic. <laughs> it's good to see you, Ove. So that's great. Hi. So you oh, can no, see just the away. earth, right? Right. Well, look, let me um, first apologize for my ineptitude at uh, controlling the technology here. Um, I just wanted to start really by saying uh, how much I've enjoyed the presentations over the, the last day and a half, and we're in our final afternoon this afternoon, especially the sort of student and ECR stuff. It's, it's really amazing uh, science and presentations. Not surprising, um, climate change has been a recurrent theme within the uh, program. And of course, after the catastrophic mass coral bleaching and uh, mortality, three of these major events moving through uh, the GBR over the last five years, it's um, perhaps not surprising that we see this. And of course, this is um, really unprecedented events that are being driven by record temperatures that are being driven primarily by the burning of fossil fuels and, and land use change. And so, you know, back of the envelope calculations, it's very hard to be sure of this, but we've probably lost about 50% of corals over the last 100 years to local factors and fishing pressures and so on. But we're seeing this um, steadily rising climate signal, which is now culminating in these sort of devastating loss of, of corals in the shallow waters of the Great Barrier Reef. And if we look, sort of look to the forward, and this is stuff that I've been involved in uh, through the IPCC, most of the evidence is pointing at the fact that we'll still continue to lose corals as we head towards 1.5 degrees Celsius. And that by the time we get to two degrees, we've really got you know, very small amounts of, of today's corals are present on, on, on reefs. And of course, this has implications for biodiversity and of course, the millions of people that depend on reefs for income and, and food. And of course, climate change is not just about increasing tropical sea temperatures and impacts on coral reefs. Almost every sort of physical uh, uh, is now changing, many at rates which have not been seen for tens of thousands of years, if not millions. And so we're really in this world of sort of hotter, more anoxic, um, more acidic, fueling changes in, in currents and, and, and coastal flooding and so on. So there's this huge sort of deluge of, of change going on. And not surprisingly, uh, when you look across biological systems, and this really started to show up about 20 years ago, you're starting to see these really major changes in things like, you know, where species are located, there's an expansion of dead zones, these sort of anoxic areas, um, flattening of reefs, you know, physiological stress, you name it, it's happening. And of course, it's impacting fisheries and coastal protection and, and having these, these impacts. And of course, that's a pretty standard story, right? It's, um, and it makes you think the, the, the ocean is a victim. Um, and I suppose you can say it's, it, it's uh, facing uh, really big changes and these things are not, not going in the right direction. So this, this idea that the ocean is uh, part of this drama as only a victim. Um, and so by concentrating, by, by sort of really focusing on uh, negatives only, um, we're in a position where we may uh, over, we may m make the oceans more of a, a victim. Well, let's say they, by doing this, we may ignore the fact that the oceans have a number of key solutions to climate change. And that's what I really want to talk about. And this is um, embodied in a fairly large report uh, that was commissioned by the HLP, and I'll talk about uh, them. Uh, and it really, um, explored um, using experts from a whole range of different um, uh, disciplines from people that understood blue carbon to people that understood uh, shipping or, or uh, large-scale renew renewable uh, uh, energy enterprises. And I think what we've discovered um, is truly encouraging. And I want to go through this report and really just outline where these um, um, five areas of promise exist. Um, demonstrate their potential to impact the, the problem so that we're not in the, you know, cosmetic conservation group that Dave Bellwood reminded us off yesterday. Uh, and then to discuss how we might um, hitch the solution uh, here onto uh, that of the uh, COVID-19 pandemic. And then to talk a little bit about the sort of political background and why this one 
uh, I think this has real chances of success. Well, this figure illustrates the range of ocean-based activities considered by the author team. Uh, the numbers uh, below each option are a sort of a best and worst case scenario in terms of CO2 uh, abatement or, 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 or emission reduction. And in each case, we had the sort of experts sort of really uh, screen these quite closely in terms of not only their technical potential, uh, potential or, or uh, geophysical potential, but in the sort of economic, social and political sort of sphere. And that's really important because often the case you might say, well, you know, floating nuclear is a great option. Uh, let's, uh, let's go with that because we're getting the best bang for buck in terms of avoided emissions and, and so on and so forth. But of course, we know that that uh, really would not get through probably the economic lens uh, or the socio-political lens. And so we've, we'd be looking at these technologies. And so at the end of the day, uh, there was uh, uh, four, five major areas in which there are opportunities to either offset emissions or uh, directly take them up. And I'll just run through these quite quickly. The, the first one on the left-hand side there is scaling up of ocean-based renewable energy. And these are floating solar, uh, floating wind farms and so on. Uh, and if you were to um, concentrate on, on uh, that as an option, uh, most of the experts in, in that, that area were really convinced that um, you could save up to probably 5.4 gigatons of CO2 equivalents annually by 2050. Another strong favourite was the idea of decarbonising domestic and international shipping and transport. Uh, this is using low carbon fuels, the eventual transition to hydrogen power, um, new hull designs, um, the way you sail the ships and all of this, that could actually end up cutting uh, uh, emissions by 1.8 gigatons, that's billion uh, CO2 equivalents, uh, billions of tonnes of CO2 equivalents annually by 2050. Uh, another was blue carbon, and I know a lot of people in this audience are with that. Uh, the, restoration, the protection, um, seagrass beds, uh, salt marsh, mangroves, all of those um, uh, estrine, um, um, estrine ecosystems have uh, potential in terms of uh, avoiding emissions entering the atmosphere. Uh, it was estimated that up to about one gigaton, one billion tonnes of, of CO2 equivalents could be avoided. Um, another uh, strong favourite was the utilising of low carbon sources of protein from the ocean. Um, protein, when you make it uh, in the ocean through the cultivation of fish or, or what, uh, has a much lower carbon footprint than um, protein um, grown on land in terms of sheep and cattle. And so if you were to significantly shift um, part of that diet to more in obviously in a sustainable way, um, shift that diet to be more marine orientated in terms of its uh, protein uh, production, uh, you, could, you could save potentially or, or offset around 1.24 gigatons of CO2 equivalents. Whereas the first four um, were there on the shelf and, um, and I think have uh, a fairly reasonable argument in terms of their um, economic and socio-political um, 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 uh, likingness, if you like. Um, the fifth one, which has uh, been around for some time, which is the storage of carbon in the seabed, um, that, that's a case where you've got a huge amount of resource. You know, you can take the CO2 and pump it into the deep sea. Uh, it's, it's very uh, cost effective compared to other, other ways of, of avoiding carbon emissions or sequestering carbon emissions. But of course, it comes with a whole bunch of risks that we don't know the answer to. And so um, the, the team decided that basically around about two gigatons of CO2 equivalents uh, could be avoided by 20 um, uh, surety. Now, these are really big, right? Uh, but of course, we don't really know whether they are big enough to make a difference. And so the next part of the project uh, looked at comparing um, the uh, emission reductions or emissions avoided uh, to the uh, 
uh, amount of emission reductions needed to achieve the uh, to achieve the Paris Climate Agreement. And so this next um, slide shows uh, that analysis. And basically, on the first five columns there, the numbers you've already seen in terms of of uh, avoided CO2 emissions uh, by uh, 2050 annual. Uh, and they sum up to 11.8. And so when you look at the required reduction for getting to 1.5 degrees Celsius, which is about cutting 56 uh, gigatons of CO2 equivalents, uh, 11.8 divided by um, 56 is around about 21%. Now I wanna stop, this number of 21% is highly significant because very few other options that are ready to, to go, if you like, that to be invested in, um, have that much impact. And so the idea of 21% of the problem of avoiding emissions and getting to 1.5 degrees Celsius, uh, the fact that this could be made up by the ocean options that we've been talking about was highly significant. Now this next figure shows um, uh, from 2015 until 2050, and it's showing us the pathways of, of different options. The orange um, pathway here is the current policy baseline. Basically, it's what we've agreed to put into play through a hum, whole bunch of, uh, of international mechanisms. And of course, it's going in the wrong direction. Down here, we've got the, um, the, uh, uh, the reduction in emissions uh, that you would need to have uh, to get to 1.5 degrees Celsius. And so the challenge for that, that first uh, analysis that we did is to see how much of this drop from the orange to the blue uh, would be achieved in 2050 uh, if we were to uh, put into play these different technologies. See that it comes some way to closing that gap. There's still a lot of work to be done, but it's extremely exciting that there's, there's uh, some really tangible things that can be done, not too controversial and uh, the emission reductions down. If we end up slipping to two degrees, it's still a significant amount of reduction. Of course, with those remarks about two degrees up front, um, it's not the best option overall. So the whole, here, the whole struggle here is to bring that, whoops, sorry, bring that to here over the next 10 years. And that's, of course, uh, a great challenge. But of course, the big question is who is? And in considering this issue, I want to go to some other global issues that we're currently facing. And of course, that's uh, the restarting of economies after COVID-19 has passed through uh, many a poor nation or rich nation. The, um, this, this diagram illustrates the approach that more and more governments are taking uh, in terms of restarting their economies uh, after things like recession uh, or after uh, COVID-19. And it basically is a simple uh, approach. Um, governments invest uh, uh, trillions of dollars into uh, usually things like infrastructure uh, development, uh, you get people building and building and building that has some benefits, but the major uh, opportunity here is that it creates jobs. And of course, uh, that delivering jobs to people, then people to buy things and, you know, hopefully the economy be, uh, gets kick-started. And that uh, was one which I'm sure you'll remember with the Rudd government, uh, where after 2008, investing in that way um, avoided Australia slipping into a recession. So that's one way to uh, kickstart uh, economies. So the question is, why not take those four opportunities uh, from in the ocean and use those to uh, kickstart the economy? So you've got the advantage that you're actually uh, solving climate change at the same time as restarting the economies after something like COVID-19's passed through. And of course, that makes a lot of sense and it'd be great to discuss it in the question time, 
But the idea might be that we invest in, in offshore wind, hydrogen power, shipping, blue carbon, that's uh, creating jobs, it's creating social benefits, and it's solving at the same time uh, uh, climate change. And that's uh, the reason why it could be seen as uh, killing two birds with one stone. Of course, when you look through those ocean options, they have lots and lots of other features which are, would be beneficial in addition to their ability to uh, reduce emissions and so on. The idea of better diets, uh, healthy, uh, healthy coastlines, greening industry, all of those things have benefits. And of course, they uh, feed back into uh, economies starting up. So I think this makes a lot of sense. Well, we just heard from John about the importance of leadership. And this is certainly the case with a particular problem as well. And in fact, this is where this uh, project uh, has a lot of, because it's already got um, a, a cadre of leaders, 14 of them, uh, chaired by Norway, the Prime Minister of Norway and the President of Palau. And it's this network now that's going to be pushing forward uh, these types of policy changes. And so I'm really excited by the, the fact that we've got uh, this opportunity. And this is part of a high level panel for a sustainable ocean economy. Um, it has uh, Prime Minister Scott Morrison on it, it has a range of, of key leaders. And it's this idea that um, this group um, will make and prioritize enhancing humanity's relationship with the ocean, the idea of harnessing no, uh, ocean knowledge, working with diverse stakeholders, bridging ocean health and wealth, and developing an action agenda for transitioning into a sustainable ocean economy. And so it's, I think this has all of the trappings of something that can move quickly and can take those, those ideas and, and put them into play. So if you want to learn more about this in the lower left hand corner there, there's the website uh, for the panel. Um, it's very well organized and I, I, I think it's going to be fun to work with. Um, and if you want a copy of the report that I talked about just now, uh, you can pull out your smartphones and if you're smart, uh, you're, you can take a picture of uh, the, uh, scan, the scan code there and, and uh, get a copy of the report. Anyway, thanks very much and sorry for messing up in the beginning. <laughs>